Father, I ask now that you get me out of the way. Take me and just put me to the side and utilize my voice. Utilize me. I am your vessel. I'm here for you. And Father, I ask that you just use me to deliver the message that you laid on my heart. So Father, just be with us today and just, uh, man, open the ears. Open the ears, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. As I was preparing for this message this, this week, i say probably in the past month and a half, I kept taking a look at what was being said and, and just trying to, to, to see if there's anything pointing in any direction imaginable. And I wrote down here topics for the last three weeks. Three weeks ago, Pastor Dwayne talked about touching others' lives. Well, that takes something. It takes something of us, an action. There's something we need to do in order to do that. Two weeks ago, Pastor Luke stood up here and said, Go bold! Well, if you don't take an action on that, you might as well sit down. Because going bold means exactly that. Get up and move. Step out. Stand over in the square in Dillsburg and scream as loud as you possibly can that God is in charge and Jesus is alive. Last week, Pastor Dwayne again turned returning to your first love. Every one of these takes an action, something we need to do. It takes commitment in order to do this. There's not one of these that if you sit down and really think about it, there's not one that doesn't challenge us to do something. Now, as I was going through this the past, i say the past three months, two months maybe, every conversation that I had with anybody, I kept hearing the same word. And I kept thinking to myself, okay, God, obviously you are telling me something. But what I kept hearing from him was change. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I went on, did a Google search, and I'm going, okay, what's the percentage of people who really like change? But before we get to that, what I need you to do is understand what kind of change I'm talking about. There are changes that are fairly easy. It could be that you want to change the color of your living room. That change is really easy for me because I hate to paint. So my wife does the painting. But it could be changing that color. It could be that we have to change the style of clothes that we wear. It could be that we have to step out and just Look at something and go, yeah, I'm not quite sure. We want to change the gardening on here. I don't like these flowers, whatever it might be. Ladies, I am not picking on you. But I, <laughs> that same reaction, I had that same reaction in the first service. I'm not quite sure how that worked. <laughs> but, <laughs> but here's the deal. You might want to change your hairstyle. So what's it take? Longer? Shorter? Different color? Different highlights? You can put in highlights, you can put in low lights, and yes, I lived with a house of women. Trust me, I understand when it comes down to changing your hair. You might pull your hair back. You might let your hair down. Both of my girls have incredible curly hair. And they will love to straighten it. So if you have curly hair, you might straighten it. If you have straight hair, you might go and get a perm and have it curled. These are simple changes. 
The type of change that I'm talking about is personal change. Change that is actually challenging. This could be dealing with you spiritually. But the change is always a challenge. It doesn't matter how we look at it. There's always a challenge behind it. I would not normally ask this question, but after doing some research, I really wanted to test the theories that these people had and, and the percentages they had online. Now, here's what I need to do. I need, for everybody in here, I need you to be honest. Because the question I'm going to ask, I want you to raise your hand. How many in here love change? Now, remember the change I'm talking about. Okay? Would you believe? Studies show 30% of people like change. I proved it wrong in first service. I proved it wrong in this service. They like three people. Uh, that's not 30%. Not even close. But you have to understand that 30% is so blown out of proportion that everybody I've ever talked to, well, I was in the IT field for 10 years. People do not like change. To a point to where I made some changes, enhancements, I called them, and I had a lady look at me and, well, let's put it this way. I could not have her stand on this platform and tell me what she told me. When it was all said and done, she looks at me and she goes, I'm not doing it. She looked at her supervisor and said, done. She was gone. She walked out and never came back. And I'm thinking... The change was, was to enhance what you were doing to make things easier, and you didn't like it. So it kind of put her in a whole different situation. Look, we all know that change is hard. It's hard because our brains are wired to do the same thing over and over and over again. It does not matter whether it's good for us or bad for us. We get into a routine. Our brains are wired to continually do this. We also know how challenging it can be to go through change. But the positive consequences is really awesome. You will find out it could be anything from changing to make things better or changing to make you better. These are all things that we have to take a look at. As I was looking through today, this past week, I pulled off a, a, a situation out there that says, okay, this is why people don't like change or this is why they just resist it. It was probably 12, maybe 14 different things. I had to narrow it down. I narrowed it down to four. Here's the four. Loss of control. Change interferes with the autonomy and can make people feel they have lost control over their territory. What's that mean? Well, pretty plain and simple. If I start a program, it's mine. If I need to give up part of my program, that's change. I'm losing part of my territory. Excess uncertainty. Not sure what to do or how to do, to do something. Feeling of going, through, going into something blindly. How many can say they understand that one? Anytime change occurs that we're not used to, 
or anytime we have to change something that's outside of our norm, we end up looking at it and going, I'm not quite sure I want to do that. I want to, I want to, I want to process this a little bit more. Everything seems different. Routines become automatic. But change jolts us into consciousness. Now think about it. Routine becomes automatic. You're driving someplace. Luke, I'm going to use you. How's that? Drive to Virginia. It's like a no-brainer, right? You know exactly where you're going. Probably get down there and sometimes you're wondering, well, I don't even remember how I got here. And I'm just using him for an example. I can say the same thing for me or for anybody else that's in here. You go someplace and you've been going there for years, whatever it might be. You're driving the same routes. You're going in the same direction. It becomes a routine. You don't have to think about it. I always look at it as a no-brainer. But once you have to make that change, now you've got to think about it. Now you've got to process what it is and where you're going and what's happening. Loss of face. Change is a departure from the past. Routine, doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Well, we've done this for the past 20 years. No sense changing now. I have to think about it. I don't want to do that. You can look at this, this, just these four alone. You can look at them in your personal life. You can look at them as your spiritual life. In your spiritual life, are you looking at this the same way? Is everything routine? Or are you stepping out and doing something totally different? Why is change so important? On an individual level, change is important because it's the precursor to growth. We don't grow by keeping things safe. We don't don't grow by preserving the status quo. All personal growth comes from meeting the challenge of change. You read that again. Personal growth comes from the challenge of personal change. When I was thinking through this, God showed me two different people in, in Scripture that he wanted me to relate all this to. So if you have about your Bibles, will you please open it up to Luke 19? 1 through 10. We're going to read through this story. Now understand that the two two stories, you're going to see two different complete outcomes. Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest at your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. 
Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responds, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be the true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who were lost. So who was Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector in the region. What's that mean? He was here as the chief tax collector, and there were multiple tax collectors underneath him. So everything had to flow through them and come up and flow through him. Due to the fact, due to the fact of his business and the way he did business and the way business was done by the tax collectors in that time, he became very rich. He was very well taken care of. Now, I don't believe that, that Zacchaeus had any intention whatsoever to draw attention to himself. Because if he wanted to, he'd have just walked right out as Jesus was coming by and said, hey, hi, you know. But he climbed up in a tree. He climbed up in a tree in order to see this Jesus that everybody kept talking about. And all he wanted to do was see him. Can you imagine his surprise when Jesus walked over and looks up in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm coming to your house. At that point in time, Zacchaeus had a choice to make. Besides all that, he had all these people who were standing there. You can imagine when Jesus pointed, looks at him and says, Zacchaeus, all these people probably turned around and looked and said, well, where is, what, where, where, here, oh. You know, and then they get upset because he says, I'm going to your house. So Zacchaeus had a choice to make. He had one of two things to do. Number one. He could have sat back and gone, hey, I'm out. He could have climbed down the tree, scooted out through the crowd, and, and he'd have been gone. Or he could have done exactly what he did. He came down, he went to Jesus, took him to his house. He not only takes him to his house, but in this story, as, as he is sitting there talking with Jesus, he looks at Jesus, not, he wasn't told what to do. He looks at Jesus and said, hey, I'm going to do, and he tells him, I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody on their taxes, I'm going to pay them back four times the amount. What an incredible testimony. He stepped out, took that challenge, and made a complete 180-degree change in his life. That would not have been normal for any tax collector. But he knew what he had to do. And because of what he did, it completely changed his life. Not only his life, but the life of his household. It changed everybody. His, his life went from gimme, gimme to here you go. His testimony had to just shock everybody. You can now turn to Luke 18. Verses 18 through 22. 
Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your mother and father. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad. For he was very rich. The rich man's responses were completely different than Zacchaeus. He was not willing to change anything in, to change anything in his life, period. He didn't want to give up the things in order to become a follower of Jesus. Think about it. We all work hard for the things that we have. We work hard for our house. We work hard for our cars. We work hard for everything that we have. What would you do if Jesus stopped you and said, I need you to sell everything you have don't keep the money I need you to give it to the poor then and only then can you come and follow me how would you react how would you see your what would you see yourself backstepping a few things Changing some stuff like, oh, well, you know, well, yeah, I, I got it. I, okay, uh, all right, whatever. Trying to get away from whatever it is that, that Christ has asked you to do? Look, as we're called and given assignments, there are things that we must give up or change in our lives in order to do the things we're called to do. That's each and every one of us. I think back, I think back to when God told me I had to go to Africa. Now, what I need you to understand is this. The trip was being set up by the skate park. Nothing against the skate park. Man, I love, I, I love Dave and Karen. I love Andy. And, and man, it was just, I can't even tell you the trip. It's a whole nother that would be a whole nother messy someday. But here's the thing. The only people I knew that were going on this trip was Dave and Karen Browse and Andy Barnhart. Now for me, back then that was a step. I was not the type of person who would have gotten involved with people that I don't know anything about. The only thing I knew was God kept telling me, you need to go. I sat down on the sofa beside Robin, and I looked at her and I said, hey, I got something I need to talk to you about. She goes, okay. I'm thinking, I, I'm not sure how she's going to react, to be honest with you. I had no idea. And I said, what if I told you I have to go to Africa and pray from God that I'm supposed to go? She spins around and looks at me and she goes, if that's what God told you, then go. You need to go. Step one. 
I know I have to go. But here's the thing. I went to the meeting, the very first prayer meeting, and I walked into Dave Browse's house, got to talking to him. We went in to sit down and have our prayer meeting. And I'm looking around going, I have no idea who these people are. None. I ran into Dave a couple days after that meeting. Dave looks at me and he goes, I got to tell you this. I said, what's that? He goes, everybody else was in that meeting. When you left, looked at me and went, who is he? Is he going along? Why is he going along? What's he doing? These were all questions I had for myself. But I can tell you, and it's a shame, it's a shame that Derek Chateau is not here today because he could tell you the whole story. He could tell you what happened. He could tell you the things and, and how God had to change in me, but he had to change in them because I was the outsider. They weren't sure. But when we got finished with this trip, it was incredible. So I had an opportunity. Uh, Pastor Mike and I were sitting down and we were talking. And I don't know if I really had a chance to, to reveal to him anything about the trip. So I proceeded to tell him, and I sat down and told him how, look, God showed up, he did this, God showed up, he did this, God showed up. It, I mean, it was just one thing after another, after another, after another. And I stopped and I looked at him. And I said, what I need to do is I need to tell you something. Don't you fall fair. I said, for me, I live in a box. What's the box? I said, this box is my comfort zone. Now, I can look around here, and I guarantee you, everybody else can say they might not call it a box. I called mine a box. We all have comfort zones. For me, mine was a box. What does that mean? I could open it and peek out, but I never wanted it to come out. And I put the lid back on. The more God showed up, the more I hit a point to where it was like, okay, I can look out, I can see what's going on, I can walk out, I can step out, I can do different things. The more God shows up, the further away from that box I, I end it. I hit a point to where I could touch it, I had a point to where I could see it, the rest of it, I didn't know what was going on. God kept showing up and I kept getting further and further away from this box. I hit that box to a point to where I didn't even see it. I had no idea where it was. I looked at Pastor Mike and I said, that box, I never want to go back to. I never want to be part of that box again. My comfort zone is no more. I'm stepping out. I'm doing what God's calling me to do. I don't want to go back there. I don't, want to, I don't even want to see it. I don't want it to be part of me. I had to change. Because if I didn't accept the change that God wanted me to do, I'd still be in that box. I'd still be doing the same things. I wouldn't be doing anything different. Every time God shows up, Every time God gives me an assignment, I know I have to change. I can't stay the same. That's no different than it is with you. Every time God shows up, it is time to make changes in your life. 
God didn't say it was going to be easy. God didn't say it wasn't going to be a challenge. What God said was, listen to me. Our response should be plain and simple. Yes, Lord, here I am. We should not be sitting back and going, well, maybe, uh, not quite sure. I'll, I'll think about it. The more we think about it, the further we get away from God. I want you to look at something, and I'm going to give you this. I kind of wrote this down. It might sound a little crazy. Okay? Here's a crazy way to look at this. Do you want to do things the hard way by stepping out and making changes, which is not always comfortable or easy in order to serve God? Or... Do you want to do things the easy way and comfortable way and not make changes in your life like the rich man? You need to understand something. Staying the same means zero growth. As I was thinking about this and running, processing this all through my head this morning, I kept thinking, God, God showed me a whole nother picture. God shows me this pond. A pond. Thinking, okay, it's a pond. What's the, I'm not quite sure I get it. The pond is filled with stagnant water. What causes water to become stagnant? It's not stirred up. There's no fresh water coming in. There's nothing that's happening. It's just sitting there. It's just, it's doing nothing. God says, I need you to tell the people in the church that stagnant water is not good in any way, shape, or form. We need to get moving. We need to stand up and listen to what God is telling us to do and start moving at it. Let's relate this to the church. How can we figure on growing if we're not willing to change the things we need to, both personal and corporate? It takes all of us, not just a few. We're one body, one body, made up of many parts working together. I really think it's time that we take a hard look at ourselves. I think we need to take a hard look at what it is that we need to change in our lives and decide what is it we're going to do. We're going to sit back and wait? Or are we going to keep pushing forward, keep moving forward on what it is that we need to be doing? I said in first service, and I'm going to, I'll keep this very short, but I said in first service, I wouldn't be standing here right now doing what I'm doing if I didn't change something here and in my entire life. You can ask my wife, she will sit there, she will tell you. I preferred back here, uh-huh, uh -huh. yep, mm-hmm. For me to come forward to say anything, to talk to people, to teach, to preach, to do anything, was an incredible change in my life. I wouldn't be doing this today if I didn't make changes in my life. 
I knew this is what God wanted me to do. Rachel, if you can come up, please. God gave me a whole different way of closing today. And I can tell you right now, I, I, it, was, it took me a while to process this. What I need is I need everybody to stand. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine, imagine your quiet place. For me, mine's along the shoreline, sitting in a chair, could be reading a book, could be just sitting there watching the waves roll in, hearing the waves. Yours might be that you're, I don't know, in the mountains somewhere at a cabin. Might be sitting in your living room just meditating and reading. But I need you to imagine your quiet place. You're right there right now. And what you feel and see is there somebody walking up towards you? You have no idea who it is. And it doesn't alarm you. You don't feel any kind of presence that would stir you in any way. And as this person walks up towards you, he comes over and he sits down right beside you. You look at him, but you really don't know him. still nothing going off you're still not thinking of anything that this is you know out of the norm this gentleman turns around and he looks at you and he starts to talk to you and you realize that it's Jesus and Jesus is sitting there and he's talking to you and Jesus goes I have an assignment for you I have something I need you to do for me He tells you what it is. When he's done, all he says is this, come meet me. And he leaves. You're not sure exactly what it is that you need to change in your life. You're not quite sure how this will even work. But what God told me was this. What I'm going to ask you to do. Jesus said, come meet me. Jesus is up here at this altar right now. And Jesus is waiting on every person to take that step of faith. I asked you right now, are you willing to take that step of faith and come to this altar right now? If you are, right now, let's... Right now, we can move, we can come to this altar and be part of whatever it is that Jesus is asking you to do. I don't know what it is. I absolutely don't know. That is between you and God. But I can tell you this. The more you step out, the more you step toward what it is that God wants you to do, The feelings are incredible. It is so powerful. Anybody, please, come on. Anybody else? Don't hesitate. Please don't hesitate. I'm I'm just feeling some hesitation out of some people that you're just not quite sure. I'm not sure if I want to make that step. I know I'm not sure if I want. I'm not sure. Be sure. It's a step of faith. It's a step of faith. We don't have to be sure. It's a step of faith. 
God already knows what it is. God knows what he wants you to do. He just wants to know if you're obedient. Oh, Father. Father, you see your people, they're here. You see them standing in front of you. You see them at the altar right now. They're here for you. They're not here for me. They're here for you. They're here to show that you are more important in their lives than anything else. So Father, I ask that you just put a blessing upon each person who's standing here right now. Take them and show them. If, they, if there's a little cloudiness or not quite sure what it is, make it clear, make it exact so that there's no guess whatsoever. Father, this is your people. This is your church. Show them and guide them, Father. Show them everything that they need to know. Speak to them. If they are having hesitation, Father, I'm asking right now that when they go to sleep tonight, somewhere during the night, you reveal to them in their sleep as clear as clear can be, just like when I went to Africa and you made it so clear that I was to go. I ask you to do the same thing for them right now. Father, what a blessing it'll be to see all these people stirred and moving and ready to go. Father, we love you. We love you so much. We give all glory, honor, and praises to you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' precious name.